Well, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you that are here in person. I know we have maybe a number of friends that are joining us online as well. And uh, we are nearing the conclusion of a series that has quite the provocative question to it. Why is there pleasure? Why is there beauty? Why, why do we experience goodness in this life? And if I could maybe recap some of the things we've talked about, why, why is it that we get to experience the beauty and the wonder of nature? Or why is it that we have the opportunity to build friendships in our lives that truly do fill our souls? Or why is it that we experience intimacy, romance, uh, profound questions, particularly when we maybe stare down the reality that life isn't all about the good things, that there are pain, that there is pain, that there is heartache, that life has its fair share of those moments too. And if we're honest, some of us, maybe all of us in the journey of faith, the experiences of pain may lead us to places where we wonder and we question, I mean, does God even exist? Is, is he, is he really out there caring about me and my life? And, and I just want you to know, I'm, I'm not here to discount that question. But what we've endeavored to do in this series is say as much as we do need to give a response to the question of why is there pain or suffering, I think it's also important for us to offer a response to the question, why is there pleasure? Why is there goodness? Why is there beauty? And does the mystery of those questions actually point to the fact that there is a God, uh, a God who's in our world and in our lives, and he's the God that gives those good things to us, as well as the God who comforts us in some of the pain and the hardships that we do endure, which leads to the topic that we have for today. Why do we experience generosity in this life? Maybe another way to say it, why is it that we receive things that we did not earn? Or why is it that we have the power to, not, to act not just in our self-interest, but actually to act in the interest of other people? And realizing that some of those acts of giving may actually disadvantage us in some way. You know, if you have a... Uh, <clears throat> like a survival of the fittest kind of mentality to the world or an understanding of the world, then the experience of generosity is very paradoxical. It might even be downright confusing. Because we live in a world where not only are we the recipients of generosity, but if we kind of search our own stories and our own experiences, we realize that we find ourselves drawn to being generous. That there's something maybe in us that goes that direction. And of all the topics we've talked about, this would be maybe a hot take, you would say. But I think generosity might be the experience that gives us the most pleasure and joy in life. And so maybe an important question would be, where did that come from? You know, that question has sparked the curiosity uh, of the research world. And there was a, a decades-long global study that was commissioned to provide a response to that very question, where did generosity come from? And the findings actually came out in 2018. And they were put together by the University of California, Berkeley. And it was a white paper called The Science of Generosity. And here's kind of the headline conclusion. Humans are a generous species, and the currents of generosity run deep through us. As such, generosity has its roots not just in our individual development, but also in our very biology. You know, the, the study actually goes on to say that generosity activates the same reward pathways in the brain as sex and food. So how interesting is that? Two other topics that we have endeavored to cover in the series. And in fact, if I could just take a quick aside, next week we, rack, we wrap up the series on the beauty of food. And uh, Pastor Joel and I were arm wrestling on who should preach that message. Because, because I'm kind of a self-identified foodie. 
so I love going to, you know, eat food, restaurants, but he's the son of an actual restaurateur, so he won, and uh, <laughs> he's, he's got a message for you that, I'll, I'm going to promise you this, it'll activate your taste buds, so you got to come back next Sunday and be part of that, but, but back to the study on generosity. There, there's another finding that was in this study that I thought was so fascinating, and it's a finding that actually confirms words that were said 2,000 years before this study was ever commissioned. <coughs> it was something said by Jesus himself. And b- before I read those words, uh, uh, or before I read the rest of those uh, findings from the study, uh, I want to read for you these words of Jesus, <coughs> which interestingly, this is maybe a little Bible trivia um, nugget for you, but uh, these words from Jesus were quoted words by Paul. So this is the only time in Scripture that we have a record of Jesus saying something that we don't have a record of him saying in the Gospels. So another way to say it is that this saying from Jesus that Paul's going to quote, it's a saying that was passed down in the oral tradition. And it actually wasn't written down in the Gospels, but it was a saying that they heard from him in his teachings. And somebody just was like, we got to keep saying that. That's a great saying. And so Paul, Paul says this in Acts 20, verse 32. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me here. It's a longer passage, so I'm not going to put it on the teaching screen. But, you know, the setup here is Paul is nearing the end of his life. And he gathers together church leaders that uh, are in a city called Ephesus. And so he helped plant that church. And, you know, Paul, Paul's coming to them and he's saying, look, uh, these, are, these, these are my last words to you. And so he gathers them together and he says, I, I want to give you some encouragement. Okay, so that's kind of the setup here. And so let me read this, Acts 20, verse 32. I'm going to go all the way down through verse 38. And, you know, as you listen to this in, in your mind's eye, in your imagination, you can just think about this. Leaders gather around Paul. He's given him his final words. And here's what he says to them. He says, and now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. And then he closes with this. And you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad, most of all, because he had said that they would never see him again. And they escorted him down to the ship, uh, a ship that was taking him to Jerusalem. And he never did see them again. They never did see him again. It's a sobering moment in Paul's journey because he was later arrested. He was later sentenced to death because he just had this unrelenting passion to share Jesus with anyone who wanted to hear. And his last words to a group of church leaders, the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, Some translations actually render this, uh, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And and you know, the the way that this kind of saying is structured is it's not trying to say that Receive, or giving a gift always brings more pleasure than receiving a gift. The, the way that it's structured is it's trying to say when you have a life of giving, you're going to experience more joy than if you have a life of receiving. Because I, I know, and some of you probably know this too, we've had plenty of moments in our lives where we experience the joy of receiving. You know, I, the moment that comes to mind for me was when my parents surprised my sister and I on Christmas with a trip to Disney World. And it felt a bit underwhelming to begin with because we got this stuffed Mickey Mouse toy with this mysterious envelope in his hand. But, you know, once, you, once we opened it up and we read what was inside, I mean, we just, we jumped and we screamed. There was just delight that welled up in us as we, we realized we're going to experience the magic of Disney as kids. 
And, you know, as I share that story with you, I'm sure there's some memories that flood into your heart of like, yeah, there's, there were these moments where I just experienced the joy of receiving. And so, again, what we have in this saying of Jesus is not, not this sense that we should feel guilty or selfish when we experience the goodness of receiving. But again, this is helping us realize that if we have a life that's focused only on receiving, ironically, we're going to be empty. We will find true life, true blessing, when we experience a life of giving, a life of generosity, which leads us back to that global study. So check out this finding, the most fascinating finding, I think. Our studies also point to the positive consequences of generosity for the giver. Giving is associated with better overall health, delayed mortality, and greater vitality and self-esteem. But only, great parenthetical statement here, but only if the giver chooses to help on their own accord. And then look at this last line. Moreover, our studies have shown an indispensable link between generosity and happiness. Study goes on to say, our studies have found that people are happier when spending money on others than on themselves, and this happiness motivates them to be generous in the future. Even small acts of kindness, like picking up something someone else has dropped, makes people feel happy. Fascinating, right? A decades-long global study confirms the very words of Jesus said 2,000 years earlier. It is better, it is more blessed, you will find more happiness in a life of giving than in a life of receiving. And that powerful truth impacts our physical well-being. We live longer. It impacts our emotional well-being. We actually have higher self-esteem. And the impact of living a life of giving is so far-reaching that being generous actually makes us better at work, too. Uh, there's a... a renowned business professor at the Wharton School of Business named Adam Grant, and he discovered this beauty of generosity while he was studying successful workplaces. And he writes about his findings in a book appropriately titled Give or Take, and uh, a Give and Take. And in that book, he kind of categorizes people at work into three major categories. So he says, at work, you typically find takers, matchers, and givers. Here, here's what he says about them. He says, whereas takers strive to get as much as possible from others and matchers aim to trade evenly, givers are the rare breed of people who contribute to others without expecting anything in return. And the most fascinating study from this book is that when givers rise to be the leaders of an organization, the impact is undeniable. So Grant uh, cites a University of Arizona study. It was, over, it was done of over 3,500 different business units. And it found this, that the companies that decided to embrace a culture of generosity from the top, they're the companies that have higher productivity, better efficiency, higher customer satisfaction, and reduced costs. In other words, these are the companies that are kind of leaving a legacy, both in the present and for the future. And so, to summarize, right, the scientific community, the academics, the, re the researchers, they all agree a life of giving makes us better personally and corporately. And this appears to be hardwired into our very identities, hard-coded into our biology, when we embrace the life of generosity, it appears that we live exactly how we were meant to live. And, and maybe as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, someone who believes in God, I think I should ask the question one more time. Where did all this come from? And maybe unsurprisingly, I'm going to offer, this all comes from God. He put this gravitational pull toward generosity into our very nature because it's his nature. You know, we, we talk a lot in Christian circles about 
kind of the qualities or the character or the essence of God, that God is good or that he's loving or that he's holy or that he's powerful. And, and I don't think we talk enough about the fact that God is generous. The most famous Bible verse in all of history says it so plainly. <coughs> John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or listen again to these words from the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. <coughs> he says to them, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Or Paul later on writes to his apprentice, Timothy. Timothy, interestingly, is leading the church in Ephesus when Paul writes to him. So the same group of people that we read in Acts 20 that Paul circled around him and said, hey, it's better to give than to receive, he writes to them through another person and says, remember what I told you? Don't forget that. Here's what he says to them through, through uh, Timothy. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives. Richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. And he goes on, they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. True life. What all the studies point to are, are right here in our scriptures. If you want to live the true life, be in love like Jesus. Be generous, realizing everything you have comes from God. Everything you have belongs to him. Everything will be returned to him. I think this is why our biology and our sociology and our psychology, they draw us toward a life of giving because it's a way to point our very souls and, and maybe the world itself back to the God who loves. A God who loves so much that he gives. And he gave his one and only son. He gave it all so that you and I could have something we could never earn or find ourselves. You know, we are the recipients of the greatest gifts from the greatest gift giver. And, and I just pray that you're always ready to receive all God wants to generously give to you. And you know, we, we call this at Westwood entering into the, the, the rhythm of life, living with open hands, gratefully receiving from God and joyfully giving it away. And so I've got a little bit of an illustration to show you here. This, this is how this rhythm works. God is first the giver. And we are first the receivers, and we receive from God faith, hope, love, goodness, time, talent, treasure, and then we are invited to give. Out of what we have received, we give hope, faith, love, and then God receives honor, glory, praise, and he gives all the more. And, you know, I, I want to help you realize this. The, this little fun diagram here, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme. You know, th this is not a gift to get program. This, this is a way to embrace the true life that we were always meant to live. It's a way for us to maybe curtail ourselves from stepping into the other reality where we live with, instead of our hands open, we live with them closed. And we find ourselves thinking different thoughts. Everything belongs to me. Everything's ruled by me. Everything's for me. And I think if we're all honest and if we consider the moments in our lives where we've thought that and lived in that, that we actually are more empty and unsatisfied <laughs> than if we live with our hands open. But even in that, right, we can just all be honest and, and we all know we don't, we don't live like this every time. We get these moments where we live with our hands closed and so... Maybe as a way just to practice this rhythm of life, can I invite you here in person, all those watching online too, unless you're driving, um, you know, open up your hands with me. And I just want you to receive this. 
I want you to receive this beautiful truth that God has blessed you. He's given you eyes to see the beauty of nature. He's given you souls to connect with the beauty of friendship. He's given you a heart to feel the beauty of intimacy. He's given you hands to unlock the beauty of generosity. And again, just as your hands remain open, this is not about you feeling guilt or shame of what you've received. This is not about you looking at what's in your hands in comparison to what's in someone else's hands. This is about you living as God made you to live. And so my encouragement to you is just to live with your hands open. Live with a posture that truly believes you are here to represent a generous God to a world that for some reason believes that life is about taking more, keeping more, or getting even. And as you just hold your hands open for one more minute, I just want you to receive this last kind of thought of, you know, the paradoxical nature of the kingdom of God that we're invited into as followers of Jesus. It says that we are most powerful when we give away our power. We, we are most rich when we give away our wealth. We are most filled. This is paradoxical. When we empty ourselves. And when we enter into, this, into these out-of-this-world practices, it's, it, it helps us draw closer to God. And it helps us understand that we were made to live a radically generous life. And it's a life that embodies God's generosity first to us. A generosity that went so far that he gave his life so that you and I could live. So th thanks for just entering into that space together. So we need those moments, don't we? Where we're just reminded, we have so much. God's given us so much. And the invitation now is for us to live the generous life. And, you know, as, as I maybe g give you a, a, a prompt toward that or an invitation toward that, and I shared this in a message I did uh, this past summer uh, on living a life of generosity, but th there's two things that we're trying to teach our kids somewhat successfully on how to embrace this generous life. And so the two invitations that we tell them is we're going to try to be a family that lives below our means and we're going to try to give beyond our comfort. And, and these two invitations, you know, one of them speaks to our trust in God as our provider. The, the other one speaks to God's our true joy. And so as, as you think about what it might look like for you to embrace the true life, the life that we were always meant to live, the life that's being confirmed in droves by all the secular research and the studies that are out there, live below your means, give beyond your comfort. Live below the level that you could because you could have more. You could keep more. And so the invitation is to just say, in, instead of trying to do that, maybe we could live below the threshold as a way to be content with less, as a way to trust God as our provider, as a way to be in solidarity with those who have less than we do, and as a way to protect our margin to be givers. And as you enter into, really, what is the joy of giving, my encouragement to you is to Give beyond your comfort, not as a badge of honor, but as a way, again, to trust God, to grow your faith, to be in solidarity with those who re rely on God for even the simplest of necessities. And so invite God to stretch you a little bit in your faith, in your giving. And, and you know what may happen? You may be prompted to live even further below your means, <laughs> not with a not motivated by an altruistic ego, but out of a heart that says, God, you've given me so much already. How can I be more like you? How can I be more like you and give all the more? And just know this too, uh, you will not be able to outgive God because his generosity is boundless. Honestly, it's effortless for him. It's his nature to give. And he put that in us. We were made to give. It's why giving brings us pleasure. It's who we were meant to be. And when we practice this beautiful joy of giving, those who receive 
are reminded that there's a God who loves them, a God who keeps showing up in this world. Sometimes we just have to kind of open our eyes to see that that's going on. And I'll, I'll you know, be honest that pastors sometimes need to be reminded of that too. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've been very on, open with the, our church family about our, our search for a home in the Chan area. It was a year's long journey for us to find a house. And, uh, but on Good Friday, of all days, it was a busy weekend for me, but on Good Friday, uh, Annie, Laker, Tate, Ivy, Crew, and Rosie, who's our dog, uh, and me, we moved into a house in Chanhassen. And <laughs> Good Friday, yes, Laker. And this, this house, we truly believe, was a gift from God. And so uh, this house kind of posted in January sometime. And uh, my, when my wife saw the picture, she was like, this is it. This is beautiful. And I can be a little investigative, maybe a bit snoopy. So I went on the county record for the house. And I was like, I wonder if I can, like, find a connection to the owners because my wife was like, this house would be amazing. And... Uh, so I was able to, through a mutual friend, make a connection to the owner. And guess what? They go to Westwood. <laughs> and so I had a phone call with them before uh, we went to tour the house. And they, they were so kind. They said, look, hey, if you're really interested, we, we want to just offer you this. We, we, we don't know how many offers we'll get, but you put your best foot forward. And if there are other offers that come in, like, we'll... Like, we'll tell you, and maybe we'll have a chance to negotiate, or you can meet, meet certain terms. Just know that we're, we want to try to give you an advantage in the process. And, you know, if any of, any of you have bought a house before, it's like, wow, like, that's amazing. No, no one ever gets that. So we were like, great. So then the day came when they, you know, realized, I think we got all the offers in that we're looking for, and they asked me to come by and kind of just talk through what they had received. And so I drive over to the house, and I'm talking with Annie on the phone, and I pull into the driveway, and for some reason, my eyes lock on the house number, 320. And for some reason, a, a Bible verse dropped into my soul. And it was, it was this verse, Ephesians 320, 320. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So I walk into the house and... For some reason, I, I also put that Bible verse on my phone. I looked it up. I should have memorized it as a pastor, but I had to look it up. And so I had the verse in my, in my back pocket. And I go up, you know, and we're sitting at the kitchen counter. And, you know, they kind of break the news to me. And they say, look, uh, we, got, we got an offer that's really nice. And I looked at the offer and I was like, oh, wow. I, yeah, we, we can't do that. And just as I was, and my heart was, you know, my heart sunk. I was like, oh, man. And just as I was about to kind of say, you know, like, thank you for this opportunity to, like, try to negotiate, he, he did something infinitely more than I could ask, think, or imagine. And him and his wife said, you know, our realtor thinks we're nuts. And our friends don't understand. I mean, it, it chokes me up right now just thinking about it. Because, you, you know, I live in the house, so you know what happened. <laughs> and they were like, you, your original offer? We'll take that one. And it was a moment that was exceedingly, abundantly, infinitely more than we could ask or think. Because another couple who is endeavoring on this journey to be in love like Jesus they decided to do something that was not in their best interest. They decided to give us something we did not earn. They decided to live below their means, give beyond their comfort, suspending what they could have and giving out of a heart that realizes everything comes from God, everything belongs to God, everything's going to be returned to Him. So why not bless? Why not give? Why not live the true life? You know, this, this is the wonder and the beauty of generosity, right? We put on display God's love and grace in nature, not just to the recipients, but to the world. And you know, this story of God's provision for our family, it's why I just believe he's on the move. He's on the move in this church. He's on the move in this world. 
Because we were made to be generous. We just were. Because we are made by a generous God. And so may we together, may we embrace the life we were always meant to live. A life where we live with open hands. Gratefully receiving from God, joyfully giving away, living below our means, giving beyond our comfort, so that the world is drawn to the God who gives. That's the beauty of generosity. And that's the goodness of our God. And uh, the worship team is going to come up here and we're going to just have a song together. It's the goodness of God is what we're going to just sing. And I'll invite you to stand with me all across this place. And as you stand, could you open your hands? And um, this, the reason we're closing with the song is, uh, one, maybe give me a chance to recover. But two, um, give us a chance just to realize there's this moment where we get to enter into realizing we have been blessed. There's things in our hands that God gave us. And he just wants us to be stewards of them, giving it back to a world that needs to know. So pray with me and open your hands. God, you see our hands open. And some of us right now, we just need to receive. I don't know what we need, what some may need to receive in this moment. Maybe it's faith. Maybe it's hope. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's healing. You're first the giver. We're first receivers. We, whatever you have for some in this room, May they receive from you. And others of us are in this moment where we realize, boy, there's a lot in my hands right now. And maybe I'm invited to give. Give to those who are in need. Give to this beautiful church that we're a part of. Give so that others realize that you're a good God. And the beauty that we get to endeavor into is confirmed. It is more blessed to give than to receive. May we enter that true life now in Jesus' name. Amen.